was uh, born and raised in East Los Angeles in the Maravilla section by um, Eastern and what was Brooklyn at the time, now it's Cesar Chavez, but uh, it's called the uh, Maravilla section of East Los Angeles. Uh, I grew up in a house on the corner of uh, McDonald and New York, a house that uh, was uh, brought to that corner when my great-great-grandparents bought that piece of land. They were the first people to build a home there, actually. It was those homes that were that used to come on the train in the Sears catalog, you know, that were already like uh, pre-assembled. <laughs> so they had one of those homes, an old craftsman that's still standing, and my, my parents still live there to this day. Now, it just occurred to me, should we do this in English or Spanish? I feel better in English. I have a hard time saying all that in Spanish. <laughs> Is that all right? <laughs> So in, in Mexico, at least in Veracruz and artistically, <laughs> I guess I'm better known as my friend. And uh, that happened a, a while back. I used to, I had a, rented a shop from some friends who were uh, from El Salvador. And my, my friend Victor would call him, hey, my friend, my friend, hey, how you doing, my friend? And we started going back and forth like that. And when the cojolitas came to stay with me, they, they, picked, they picked up on that. And, and pretty soon they just, I became my friend. And uh, started going to Veracruz with them, and, and they wouldn't even, you know, Jacob is kind of a weird name to say in Spanish. So either it was Jacopo, which I don't really like the sound of, or my friend. And I would just tell people to call me my friend. A lot of people think that's my name. <laughs> Mostly what we sell, what I live from, is guitarron and vihuela. Uh, musicians in in the US we're selling more and more in Mexico now but uh, yeah really the majority of the businesses is US mariachi players that's what we've been doing for 20 years now that I've been here living in Mexico we've been trying the last few years to to um, to move sales this way because still a lot of people when they come from Mexico to LA they, they try to find me so we're just trying to bring it here now to them but. But really, the majority of my work still is in the U.S. When I was, when I was uh, about eight or nine, my grandfather, uh, they had a, I remember my grandparents had their 50th wedding anniversary. And my, my grandfather got his, his brother, Narciso, and I guess they got the band back together. I had never seen my grandfather play, but he brought out all these old viejitos to play, to play. They, they played at the, my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary, and I was about maybe nine years old, eight or nine. And I was just like, wow, I never saw my grandpa. He was playing the drums, and his brother was playing the trumpet, and they had a bunch of other people I had never seen before, <laughs> a bunch of old dudes playing mambo, you know? <laughs> and uh, so since after that I was bugging my grandpa oh I wanted to learn and he knew I wanted to learn and so uh, one day he went to his closet and he brought out his drum set his old sparkly cherry red slingerland drum set with an old zildjian cymbal that was uh, back when they were still made in Turkey and his timbales that he had, and uh, he, he gave, he, well first he, he loaned them to me really, he didn't give them to me, he loaned them to me, and he passed away um, a year or two later. So when my grandfather passed away, my, my grandmother let me keep the drums, and I, I kept playing with, with the drums, with his timbales. Uh, there was a conga also that he had made, and I started to just study percussion, um, I played with different groups in East LA in the early 2000s. Right around uh, 
2001, the, the Son Jarocho movement in Veracruz started to arrive in California. Uh, thanks to certain people that were that were, did a lot of work to bring to, to bring certain groups in, um, and uh, that was the first time I, I saw uh, Son de Madera and Chuchumbe, uh, Mono Blanco, and later Los Cojolites. All within uh, maybe a, a span of a few months, all the groups came to Los Angeles. And uh, I was involved in, the, I guess, the Chicano art scene at the time. Geez, I was about 20 years old. So I was just doing, you know, what I could to be involved, driving them around here or there, or trying to just trying to hang out with them, you know. The, I really, really, really liked the music. And uh, I didn't speak any Spanish at the time. Uh, I just really liked the music. I just had to, I wanted to be around it. And, uh, in the beginning of 2003, I think actually we spent we, New Year's, the beginning of 2000, the end of 2002, we, uh, a group of Chicanos from East LA uh, went on like a, I don't know what we were thinking. We just wanted to go as a group, a, a delegation of Chicanos to go meet with all these Jarocho groups. And I guess basically declare our intent to like just to work with them in the future and I guess we were kind of seeing for shot foreseeing I guess what the the next 20 years that there's been on so much movement of people from Los, well not just the US Los Angeles in particular and California to to Veracruz and back and forth and people have come so this was in early 2003 and and we took a, a like a tour down there about 15 or 20 of us, um, I don't know what we were thinking or I don't know really what the purpose was. We just knew that we wanted to go. We wanted to go meet them. I don't even know now that you think about what, what, what did we go for? I don't know what we went for. We just knew that we needed to go. We needed to go and a bunch of us went and uh, I stayed two months and it just changed my life. I started studying uh, marimbol with uh, Octavio Rebolledo, who's an excellent teacher and, and person. And um, well, that's how I began to study marimbol. I came back to LA, uh, kept playing. And a few months later, uh, Los Cojolites came back to LA. And this time I had, they remembered me and we had spent more time together in Veracruz. And I was, it was just my luck that they arrived without a, a bassist. The, the, Marcelo was the name of the guy that played Leona for them at the time. And he was, in, he was denied his visa in, here in Tijuana. So he couldn't, he couldn't make it to Los Angeles. So the Cojolitas got to Los Angeles without somebody to play the low end. And Noé remembered me. And he pulled me to the side. This was in the Encuentro de Jaraneros in Los Angeles. I think the first or second one that they did, the first or second year. <laughs> and someone had the idea to bring the cojolitas. And there I was working at Guadalupe Custom Strings with my maestro trying to, to promote our, our business. And here come the cojolitas without a basis. And here I am sitting on my marimbol and Noé remembers me and he, he, he takes me we went off to the side and right there in the middle of Olvera Street. <laughs> and we just played music for a few minutes together. He, he told me, oh, you know, this key or that key. And I just followed him and I'm like, all right, well, look, we don't have a basis right now. This is what I could understood, what I could understand of him, you know, telling me, well, you know, why don't you do these, these shows with us while well, we're in LA this time. And so that's how I started playing with them. and. From then on, every time they would come to LA, it would, they would invite me to play. And about a year later, they just said, um, you know, basically extended an invitation to, to go and, and live with them and be part of their, their group as much. I was, I was working with the strings at the time and I had just started that, so I, I, I couldn't go live with them, but I was going very often and staying as long as I could and coming back and, just doing that, um, 
That's really where I learned to, to play song Jarocho, is with them, with Noé. Mm -hmm. The first time I met Francisco at Guadalupe Custom Strings, I went with uh, Quetzal, Quetzal Flores and Gabriel Tenorio, two musicians. Uh, Quetzal plays a jarana and Gabriel played a cuatro Puerto Rican, two instruments that you can't, you couldn't really find it strings for, you know, in a, in a store. So they they took the trek out to to Golita, right by Santa Barbara, California, where where Francisco's shop was. And that was, yeah, and I thought it was really interesting. I remember looking at his shop and just being really interested and, and feeling some kind of connection to, to the craft. Uh, a few months later, I started school at Santa Barbara and I needed work. So I called Francisco, I called Guadalupe Custom Strings, uh, I left a message. I told him, oh, I met you, you know, a few months ago. I'm from East LA. Also, he's from East LA, and um, I'm a student here, I'm a musician, I like some work during the week. He called me back the next day, he told me to come in the following day, and uh, soon after that, I, I stopped going to school at UCSB, I just realized I was learning way more, I was learning way more with Francisco than I was learning in school. Francisco's wife was a professor at UCSB, very, very um, respected person in the university. And she got another position at the University of Arizona uh, where she wanted to go. She has family there. <clears throat> so Francisco's wife got this opportunity to have another uh, position at another university. And Francisco didn't want to start his whole business over again from scratch in another place. So he started looking around at what to do, he was thinking what to do. And my mom came up on a trip one, one day, uh, we went out to the wineries to, uh, to hear him play. He used to play harp at the wineries sometimes at different events. And I was explaining to her the situation that, that, that we were in. And she had just retired. She had a little bit of money put aside, and um, she 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 had the idea to to buy the business from Francisco. Really, he sold it to us for the price of just basically his material. Like he didn't really sell; he just wanted us to have it. He he he. By that time, I had worked with him for over a year, and he wanted us to have it. So. Um, we, my mom bought the business from him and we moved everything to East LA. That was in um, 2005, I think. Margie, come here a minute, Margie. Come here a minute. This has been such a wonderful day. It was even more than we expected. And this is your life. This is my life. And I have to say that it started with a gentleman who had the business 14 years ago. He started uh, Francisco Gonzalez. And we owe this all to him because he needed to sell his business two years ago. And Jacob had been working uh, for him. And really, Francisco, I can't say enough how much we love him. Uh, he put his heart and soul into developing and making this business. And now your family is doing the same thing Davis and I, I don't know how to describe what it feels like in here but this is a very special place. You know I told you that earlier I said if you could just bottle what you feel when you hear music we wouldn't have problems in this world. Yeah. And what's your plan? I need to teach more, more. Um, my maestro passed away last year 
Francisco Gonzalez was my teacher. taught me just about everything I know about strings. I mean, I've tried to go farther than that, like he's, like he would have, like he wants me to, always wanted me to, but <clears throat> I, I really wish I could, I could ask him questions still, you know? And I don't want the knowledge that I learned from him to just go to waste. So, there's a lot of regional musicians with a lot of needs and they need to know what I know. And so my really what I'm trying to do in the future is, is continue to, to teach the craft and the logic and the science behind, um, behind what we do. Um, that's my way of supporting the culture, like making the music sound better, you know, trying to get um, when they're instruments that are not standardized, you know, a lot of there's a lot of technical issues that come about when you're trying to play and you're trying to tune and you're trying to construct instruments. And sometimes for various factors, the musicians, instead of thinking about the music that they want to play, they're, they're thinking about the problems that they're having with their strings and that they have to bend this this way and they have to, and that the strings are not, they're all the right tension. And they're, 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 they're thinking about all these other issues that are going on with their instrument and and they're not able to think about the music that they want to play so what the products do when you fix those technical problems is now you let the musician go back to where that space in their head where they're not worried about the strings anymore they can go back to their ideas and that's going to make them better musicians and that's going to make better music and that 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 makes our culture richer so so that's my way of, of, of supporting art. I like it here in Rosarito. Um, where some people see a lot of problems, I guess. I could, you could complain about a lot of things, you know, but I just see a lot of opportunity for me. Um, I think at least in the U.S., the situation I was in, trying to produce something by hand in the U.S., especially in California, especially in Los Angeles, it was a really a, I was fighting a losing battle against time and money. <laughs> and I see Rosarito as a place of opportunity. I see a lot of opportunities that I wouldn't have had in back home and so I'm very grateful to Mexico for for giving me those opportunities I'm very very grateful to be here I'm very grateful for this country <laughs>